Okay. Thanks. Yep, no worries. All right, so are you guys seeing our first slide? Yep. All right, perfect. Okay, well, thank you for taking a few minutes to listen to our talk tonight. I'm Sean Morton, and you were previously listening to Sonia Richmond. Until recently, we lived in Southwestern Ontario. Sonia worked for Bird Studies Canada and the Canadian Wildlife Service as a GIS analyst and research scientist, mapping migratory bird populations, and I worked as a landscape photographer. Three years ago, we sold our house, quit our jobs, and donated most of our possessions to pay for and begin a 27,000 kilometer hike across Canada on the Trans-Canada Trail. Today, we'll be explaining in a little more detail what we're doing, sharing some of our reasons for undertaking this journey, and elaborating on our goal of diversifying participation in the outdoors, as well as connecting people to nature through birding, which it sounds like you're all very well versed in. We'll then be sharing some photos and stories from the trail, explain why we're encouraging people to connect to nature through citizen science and birding in particular, and outline some of the things we've learned on our three years on the trail and that we share with nature groups. So as Sean said, we are in the middle of hiking across Canada, which is not something that most normal people regularly do. And it might sound very impressive walking carefree each day, trekking from sea to sea and sleeping under the stars. But let's be honest, when you see pictures of us, you probably don't think of us as outdoors people, explorers or adventurers. But that's the thing we're trying to show people. To be an explorer, you don't need to be a professional athlete. You don't need specialized skills or expensive equipment. And you don't need to be super rich. All you really need is simple curiosity. And from our own backyards to the boreal, Canada's nature is just waiting to be explored, and the Trans-Canada Trail is pretty much the perfect place to begin. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Trans-Canada Trail, or the Great Trail as it's sometimes referred to, don't worry, you're not alone. First off, it's the longest recreational pathway in the world, and it's presently 27,000 kilometers long and goes to 15,000 Canadian communities. It stretches all the way from Cape Spear, Newfoundland, the easternmost point in North America, on the Atlantic Ocean, to Victoria, British Columbia on the Pacific Coast, the Tuktiaktuk Northwest Territories and the shoreline of the Arctic Ocean. But most people don't realize it, the TCT is within 30 minutes of 80% of Canadians. This means if you've ever walked on a trail in your own community, it's likely you've already trekked on part of the Trans-Canada system. On the trail, you're able to go for short walks, long hikes, cycle across entire provinces, paddle across the continent, and even along its coastlines. When we've completed our journey, we'll have walked from coast to coast to coast, visiting all three of Canada's oceans. Now, as Sonia mentioned, most people aren't crazy enough to walk the entire length of this system themselves. Trust us, our parents wish we weren't either. In fact, fewer people have completed the entire trail on foot than have gone to the moon. According to Canadian Geographic, so large that if you started walking right now, it would take between three and four years to finish. That is, if you were to keep hiking at a brisk pace every day through every type of weather condition and during every season. To put this in perspective, when stretched out end to end, the Trans-Canada Trail reaches almost two thirds of the way around the globe. So when people hear these huge distances, their main question often is, why on earth did we choose to undertake this journey? Well, our main reason was that we felt like the digital world was starting to take over our lives and those of our fam family members. We were spending our days working in front of computers, our nights watching Netflix, and in between we were constantly checking Facebook, Instagram, and email. At the same time, a younger family member was skipping more than 40 days of high school a semester. He was stealing and lying, and eventually he lost most of his friends just to play video games. And in a way, that's no wonder. Studies have shown that the effects of video gaming and social media on the brain are stronger and more addictive than those of drugs like heroin. So even though we were almost constantly connected to Wi-Fi, we were becoming increasingly disconnected from each other, the natural world, and everything that's actually important in our own lives. We realized it was time to begin recharging ourselves and not just our devices. And we wanted to do something that was a little bit different. So what did we do? We wanted to get outside and get active, but we weren't particularly athletic people and we didn't have a lot of extra money. So we focused on the one thing that's free. We figured we could walk. So between 2014 and 2018, step-by-step step, we hiked across Ontario on the Bruce Trail 
Then we set out across Spain on the Camino Frances. We trekked across France on the Via Pondensis. And soon after that, we hiked to the length of Portugal on the Camino Portuguese. So these were all inspiring and life-changing adventures. But the moment each one ended, we eagerly began planning our next one. Now, while spending our vacation time hiking was fantastic, like many Canadians, we were still spending most of our year in front of screens and just dreaming of our next big adventure. But as we all can attest to after COVID, digital landscapes are no replacement for real ones. So that's when we realized that getting outside, connecting with nature and having adventures weren't things that had to happen only once a year. They didn't have to occur in far off countries, require extensive planning or cost a fortune. So instead of trying to cram our entire bucket list of adventures into a few precious vacation days each year, we wanted to find a way to connect to nature on a more regular basis. Now, nature means different things to different people. I think it's fair to say that when most people think of nature, they tend to imagine tracts of pristine, untouched wilderness, or we might think of a national or provincial park or maybe a conservation area. But what many of us tend to overlook is that nature can be found everywhere, even in Canada's largest cities. It can be found in green spaces and river corridors, in the trees outside our windows, in the plants that come up between the cracks in the pavement, and in the birds at our feeders, and of course, in our own backyards. There are opportunities to explore and discover everywhere. All we have to do is step outside our doors. So this seemingly simple realization is important because if we let ourselves think of nature, adventure and exploration as things that exist only in pristine wilderness or in some far off exotic location, the result is that we spend the majority of our time in front of screens planning or fantasizing about our next big trip, which we may or may not ever get a chance to actually take. On a daily basis, digital landscapes are no replacement for natural ones. And if we lose that connection with the physical world, we eventually lose our curiosity and our desire to explore, learn, and protect nature. So that simple idea is ultimately what led us to walk across the second biggest country in the world in the name of conservation and with the goal of inspiring people of all ages, cultural backgrounds, abilities, genders, orientations, and identities to get outside and connect to nature on a more regular basis through birding. So I imagine that you're curious to know what our hike has been like so far. Well, we start on June 1st of 2019, and in 420 days, we've trekked more than 10,000 kilometers from Cape Spear, Newfoundland, to the Saskatchewan, Alberta border. En route, we've seen and experienced some pretty amazing things. We've been the first to see a sunrise in North America. We've scaled cliffs on rope ladders, walked along coastal footpaths, seen icebergs and puffins, spent evenings on the sides of crystal clear lakes, and gone days in remote wilderness without meeting anyone else. We've seen whales and seals in the Atlantic Ocean, watched herds of caribou, encountered moose and deer on the trail, listened to coyotes call throughout the evenings, and had black bear encounters, and of course seen hundreds of species of birds. On the way, some of our experiences have been a little unusual. We've walked on the ocean floor with goats, slept in a haunted jail cell, been actors in local plays for Parks Canada, trekked through snow blizzards, sheltered from hail and tropical storms, hiked amid tornado warnings and a hurricane landfall on the East Coast, and continued for weeks at a time through a dense smoke of forest fires provinces away. We've climbed down coastal cliffs, crawled under fallen trees, waded into the Atlantic Ocean in a section where the trail wasn't quite finished, ventured along flooded pathways, navigated through forests, balanced across beaver dams, which were as long as soccer fields, walked through tunnels, down highways, along railways, and spent weeks at a time hiking in driving rain and playing against westerly winds, as well as discovering how difficult it was to trek through prairie mud. Despite the challenges, however, and best of all, along the way we have experienced overwhelming generosity, random acts of kindness, and countless words of encouragement from Canadians like you. Each day, depending on weather, terrain, and water availability, we hike an average of between 25 and 35 kilometers on the Trans-Canada Trail. This has varied from five kilometers on the East Coast Trail in Newfoundland, when we ended up scaling a cliff face on a rope ladder in the midst of a freak snowstorm, to as much as 55 kilometers a day along the highways of Ontario and the vast landscapes of the prairies, where there was just simply no place for us to stop for the evening. Usually while hiking, we carry everything we need on our packs and on our backs, which means that we have our tent, sleeping bags, air mattresses, camp stove, pots, water filter, our food, and of course our birding and photography gear. As you can probably imagine, our packs are pretty heavy and often weigh between 40 and 60 pounds each, 
depending on the amount of food we need to carry between resupply points. Now, at times, this might not sound like fun, but with all the truly amazing things we've seen along the way, it's actually been pretty wonderful. The fact is, a Canada and its natural spaces are amazing, and we're all really lucky to be able to enjoy the outdoors and have so much space to explore. Each day usually involves us getting up around 6 or 7 in the morning, having breakfast, packing up, and leaving about 8 a.m., and hiking till about 5.30 or dark. In the evening, we then set up camp, wash up clothes, wash ourselves if at all possible, make dinner and then filter water. And then around eight or nine, about the time you simply want to stop moving and lay down and go to sleep, our workday actually begins. It's at this time we sit down and go to work. This means that throughout the night we plan the next day's hike, as well as write our journals, draft and post a daily blog, edit photographs, update social media, answer emails and prepare for presentations, which technically takes us till about 1 a.m. And this is what the first 10,000 kilometers on the Trans-Canada Trail has generally looked like. So, of course, it has not been all hard work and no fun. It has been truly well worth it. So, as we mentioned, our cross-country adventure began in Newfoundland, where we were screeched in, kissed a cod, attended a lobster boil up on the beach, and met some of the friendliest people in Canada. So the Trans-Canada Trail in Newfoundland offers two very different experiences along two very different routes. So the East Coast Trail is a series of 25 footpaths for hikers that traces the rugged coast of the Avalon Peninsula, whereas the Trailway Trail follows the bed of the former provincial railway through the wild, remote and sparsely populated centre of the province. So we began on the East Coast Trail, which in places was extremely steep and rugged, involving rope assisted climbs and descents. Well, in other sections, it followed boardwalks, pebble beaches, and forested pathways. Along the way, we saw humpbacked and minky whales, seals, bald eagles, and crystal blue icebergs off the coast. We marveled at towering cliffs and headlands, saw sea stacks emerging out of the mist like something from Lord of the Rings, and watched as water was shot 40 meters into the air by a natural wave-driven geyser. We walked across a 50 meter suspension bridge and admired the Berry Head Arch. In addition, we visited the famous Cape Spear Lighthouse, which is at the very easternmost point in North America, and the colony of Avalon, which was one of the founding European settlements in Canada. Perhaps most impressive of all was seeing North America's largest colony of Atlantic puffins in the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve near Bay Bowles. So in addition to puffins and eagles, along the ECT, we had a chance to see many other seabird species as well, such as northern gannets, razorbills, black guillemots, and common mirrors. Amid all of this, we were treated like family by strangers, invited to boil ups, and enjoyed impromptu kitchen parties along the way. After the coastline of Avalon, we followed the trail trail, which crosses the province from east to west, and it's a gravel track that's used primarily by a thriving community of friendly ATVers and snowmobilers. This trail took us through the remote, spectacular scenery of the boreal forest, far from towns and cities, which, we'd some, which was something we both wanted to see. The boreal ecosystem covers 60% of Canada's area, and it stretches right across the northern part of the nation, from Newfoundland to BC. It's an incredibly important ecosystem because many of North America's largest rivers begin in the boreal, and it provides us with clean air and clean water. It's also known as North America's bird nursery because more than 300 species of birds live up there, and between three and five billion baby birds are born there every year. In fact, many of the birds people see in their own backyards across this nation and throughout North America rely on the boreal region. On the trailway, many of our days began with the sounds of loons on pristine lakes and the sight of the sun rising over bogs filled with wildflowers. We were privileged to watch a herd of caribou cross the plateau in front of us one day, be visited by a moose, discover these two bears outside of our tent one morning, and share the trail with a rare pine marten one afternoon. In terms of birds, we enjoyed species such as the boreal chickadee, Canada jay, ruby crowned kinglets, pine grosbeak, flycatchers, and of course, countless migratory warblers, which I find very frustrating to identify, and like the ones shown here. As we crossed Newfoundland, most of our adventure was in the wilderness, but when we reached Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, that changed somewhat. So when we left Newfoundland and hiked into Nova Scotia, we left the boreal behind, and the trail took us south through Cape Breton Island, into the famous Cape Breton Highlands National Park, to the home of Alexander Graham Bell, who was the inventor of the telephone, and along the Celtic shoreline. Along the way, we found active fishing harbors, 
beautiful beaches, wonderful views out over the Atlantic Ocean, museums, and of course, plenty of wildlife. En route, the trail provided panoramic views down the coast and took us through some beautiful scenic forests. One of the highlights for us along this stretch of pathway was known as the Celtic Shores Trail, which runs along the coast of Cape Breton Island, winding through fishing communities, down pristine beaches, and through towns that are filled with wonderful art and Celtic music. We also marveled at a huge number of bald eagles in the Brass Door Lake region, and watched great blue herons, semi-palmated plovers, least sandpipers, ruddy turnstones, willets, and a collection of other shorebirds along the coast of Cape Breton Island. And in addition to all of this, we enjoyed the Celtic music of the Rankin family and savored fresh lobster while watching the sunset in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, beyond the culture of Cape Breton, the natural wonders of Nova Scotia were a highlight for us as well. Among our favorites was visiting the Bay of Fundy and getting to see a tidal bore. The Bay of Fundy is home to 16 meter tides, which are the highest in the world. When the tide comes in, it starts to fill all the rivers that naturally flow out into the bay. A tidal bore looks like a wall of water traveling up these rivers, and it occurs at the exact moment when the rivers change direction and begin flowing in the opposite way. In addition to the tides, the vast mud flats that are exposed at low tide are one of the most important stopover points for migrating shorebirds in North America. We visited during the fall, and so we had a chance to see lots of different species of birds, including the greater yellowlegs, black-bellied plovers, and spotted sandpipers. This, of course, is only a sampling of the amazing experiences and nature in Nova Scotia. The pathways took us through forests and green spaces to ancient harbor towns, let us learn about Mi'kmaq history, and gave us a chance to explore historical forts. So next on our journey, we ventured across Prince Edward Island, and we would have to say that of the 3,000 kilometers of Trans-Canada Trail in the Maritimes provinces, in our opinion, the crown jewel is PEI's 435 kilometers of trail, which is known as the Confederation Trail. While PEI might be the nation's smallest province, it boasts one of the nicest trail systems that we've encountered yet, although the route through Quebec does provide some pretty stiff competition, as you'll see in a little bit. So the Confederation Trail runs from one tip of the island to the other, forming a complete network of pathways across the province. The entire trail is kept in immaculate condition, and it's composed of extraordinarily well cared for pathways under corridors of shade trees. It features information plaques along the routes, distance signage, and shelters for resting, picnicking, or camping along the way. And all of these things we could have only dreamed of in other sections of the Trans-Canada Trail. So it was a really a treat. The nature of the Confederation Trail, with its beautiful rolling hill scenery, quaint villages, and broad bay seascapes, makes it the perfect means for island-wide exploration. So you really couldn't ask for more. So in Prince Edward Island, we toured the province from the ferry to the Confederation Bridge, relishing the hospitality of Charlottetown, resting on the red sand of its endless beaches, and enjoying the natural beauty of the island while taking in as much of Green Gables as we could. En route across the province, we also saw a ridiculous number of great blue herons, as well as a variety of forest birds, such as common yellowthroats and northern flickers, shorebirds, and of course, waterfowl as well. So in terms of exploring and experiencing nature, PEI is a wonderful place to visit. The next province we visited was New Brunswick, which we arrived into after crossing the Long Confederation Bridge from PEI. In New Brunswick, we explored Acadian heritage, relaxed in peaceful forests, waded through marshlands while bird watching, and enjoyed amazing urban trails. Here we returned to the Bay of Fundy and followed the trail through the pristine coastal wilderness and hiked along the very tough Fundy footpath. Afterward, we followed roads through rolling forested hills and spent days hiking along the beautiful St. John River heading north. New Brunswick also offers some fantastic urban pathways through its larger cities like St. John, Moncton, and Fredericton. In the university town of Sackville, the Trans-Canada Trail became an accessible boardwalk that took us through a 55-acre waterfowl park that was truly stunning. Here, over 160 species of birds, including double-crested cormorant, American widgeon, northern pintails, hooded mergansers, and white-throated sparrows, as well as over 200 species of plants have been reported in the marsh. And even though it was pouring rain when we walked through here, the trail was full of people that enjoying this beautiful natural space within the city limits. The Riverside Trail in Fredericton was another example of a wonderful urban pathway in New Brunswick. The paved walkway took us along the banks of the St. John River, 
past beautiful historic estates and to some of the city's main attractions, all the while underneath a majestic canopy of old hardwood trees. The urban trails in New Brunswick serve as clear proof that nature can be enjoyed and explored in our backyards and green spaces across Canada, as the places they lead to are an amazing experience. So when we completed hiking across New Brunswick in November of 2019, it meant that we'd finished trekking across all of Maritimes, all of Canada's maritime region. With a few weeks of good weather left, we hiked into Quebec on Le Petit Timmy to the shores of the St. Lawrence Seaway and the community of Riviere de Louis. When we arrived there, there was a huge snowstorm going on and with frigid temperatures. And we pretty quickly decided that to end our first year on the trail at that point. Now, as we all know, COVID emerged in 2020 and provinces began limiting travel. So because of this, when we tried to return to the trail in Quebec in May, we found that the border was closed to travel. So as a result of this, Quebec stands as the only province that we have tracked piece by piece and in every season over the course of the past three years, rather than sort of consecutively east to west. However, despite the logistical challenges involved in completing La Belle Provence, our time there has been absolutely amazing. The pathways of Quebec are perhaps the most highly developed and refined in the nation. And they took us from the rugged footpaths in the Charlevoix region over the incomparable Sentier des Cap and eventually connected to the extensive multi-use cycling pathways and rail trails of the Route Verte. Along the way, the Trans-Canada Trail in Quebec took us along pilgrimage routes to historic sites and through stunning landscapes as we moved across the province. Now, one of the exciting things about trekking across Quebec was having the opportunity to visit so many IBAs or important bird areas. So for anyone who isn't already familiar with this concept, an important bird area is pretty much exactly what the name suggests. It's an area that's important to birds. So this can be because it supports a high diversity of different species or because it provides habitat for a rare or endangered species or because it's used as a stopover site for migrating birds that need to rest and refuel. So there are around 10,000 IBAs around the world, 600 of which are here in Canada. So Quebec is home to 102 of these areas, many of which are located along the shorelines and on the islands of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And amazingly, the Trans-Canada Trail took us within about 20 kilometers of 26 of these IBAs. As we walked along the St. Lawrence Seaway, it was fall, so many of these IBAs were filled with thousands of snow geese, as well as large flocks of gulls, ducks, and double-crested cormorants. And actually, while camping up on the Sentier des Cap, we could hear the sounds of the geese out on the water below us at night, which was a really amazing experience. So we've been privileged to visit quite a few important bird areas as we've crossed Canada, and they have all been wonderful places, which we would highly recommend visiting, whenever you get the chance. So as a kind of a side note, there are 47 IBAs located in, in Alberta, including the Manitou Lake area, Killarney and Dilbury Lakes along the Saskatchewan border, the Bells Hill Lake IBA, and the Beaver Hill Lake region near Elk Island National Park and Edmonton. The majority of the IBAs in Alberta are dedicated to the protection of waterfowl and shorebirds, as well as regional waterways and properties where large concentrations of species congregate. So I'm sure many of you have already visited at least some of these areas in your travels or in your conservation work, but if not, I would highly recommend checking them out. Now, upon reaching Ottawa, the nation's capital, it also meant we were in a new province, Ontario, which is one of the most challenging to summarize. With over 2,500 kilometers of pathway in the province, it took us almost four months of trekking to cover. Talking about our walk across Ontario and all the amazing wildlife we saw is equivalent to briefly trying to describe a year crossing the maritime provinces. Don't worry, we're not gonna take that long. In Ontario, the Trans-Canada Trail stretched from Ottawa in the east to Windsor in the south to Thunder Bay in the north. Hiking the TCT in Ontario is further than walking from Toronto to Florida. In short, the distance is vast, which is something most people don't see and don't realize until, you know, they're silly enough to try to walk across the province. Ontario's trails run through the nation's capital, huge city centers that take weeks to cross on foot, across vast rural landscapes to quiet Indigenous communities, through beautiful provincial parks and rugged national parks. Along the way, we ventured through cities of centers of political power, visited historic sites, 
trekked alongside can canal systems, hiked on pilgrimage routes, explored regions of environmental significance, as well as traveling across the rugged northern shorelines of Lake Superior. Despite the challenges and distances involved in crossing Ontario, we had a wonderful time and got to see tons of nature and species, as you can see here. As we hiked across the province, we encountered a huge assortment of wildlife on the trail, including porcupine, beaver, deer, moose, and black bear. In addition to which, we've seen over 100 species of birds in Ontario alone, including eastern bluebirds, Baltimore orioles, scarlet tanagers, indigo buntings, and northern hawk owls, just to name a few. Reaffirming our belief that wildlife and birds can be found anywhere in Canada, whether in a provincial park, in an urban green space, or in our own backyards right here at home. So finally, with the fall colors around us, we crossed the border into Manitoba. And here we began by hiking through the beautiful Whiteshell Provincial Park, heading a bit more north than west as we went. Now this huge park looked a lot like Northern Ontario with its vast coniferous forests, marshes and exposed Canadian shield. After Eastern Manitoba, the trail followed the Winnipeg and Red Rivers through regional indigenous reserves and Mennonite communities passing many enormous hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams along the waterways. As the trail wove its way slowly westward and we approached Winnipeg, the landscape changed from the sprawling boreal forest and Canadian shield to the vast wide open prairie and agricultural lands with their endless skies. From the provincial capital, the trail then ventured southward along the Crow Wing Trail, which is a pilgrimage route, which took us south to the Canadian American border where the TCT again shifted course, taking us northward along gravel roadways and unmaintained rail trails, which eventually led us to our next province. So as we hiked across Manitoba and into the prairies, we had a chance to see quite a bit of wildlife, including beavers, river otters, red squirrels, wood frogs, and white-tailed deer. And almost every single night that we camped out there, we heard packs of coyotes singing and calling as they hunted around our tent. So even in this vast and empty seeming agricultural landscape, there was plenty of wildlife as I'm sure you all know. It was just took us a while to learn how to spot it. Now, as you might expect, one of the really exciting things about hiking out of the boreal and into the prairies was that we started to encounter a new group of birds that don't, don't typically occur in Eastern Canada. So some of the more exciting species for us included Harris's sparrow, Lapland longspurs, black-billed magpipes, magpies, and best of all, in my opinion, large groups of American white pelicans. Seeing these enormous, strange-looking birds was a truly amazing experience. Entering into Saskatchewan, our eighth province, and the last one we'll talk about, it was our eighth province of the Trans-Canada Trail, and we continued to weave along a route that was more south and north than westerly. Apart from the beautiful sections of the trail in the province, in its parks and city centers like Regina, Moose Jaw, Saskatoon, and North Battleford, we mostly found ourselves following dusty gravel roads that seemed to go on forever. Heading westward, these grid roads took us past historic grain elevators, through the stunningly beautiful Capel Valley, across historic battlefields, through oil fields and landscapes dominated by huge rolling hills in the western part of the province that somewhat unexpectedly we arrived to as well as enjoying crossing several of Saskatchewan's rivers on small ferries. As we walked across this vast landscape, we realized it was one of extremes. We were walking through a brutal heat wave at the time, a drought, and at times it seemed we also dealt with very thick smoke from forest fires provinces away. Even the pathway would alternate between being dry cracked soil and thick prairie mud on the rare days in which we experienced any type of rain. Yet at other times in the year, this landscape can also experience deep cold, huge floods and relentless winds, as I'm sure you're aware. Much of the wildlife we saw had adapted to the tough conditions, either by becoming small and living underground, like the Franklins and Richardson squirrels or white-tailed jackrabbits, or had become huge and strong, like bison, the black bear, and wapiti, which we frequently spotted in the wide open landscapes. As we traversed our second prairie province, we also continued to see new species of birds, such as American Abyssets, Virginia Rails, and large groups of Franklin skulls. However, given that we were there in the fall, one of the most impressive things by far was seeing and hearing the huge flocks of hundreds of thousands of snow geese, ducks, cranes, and other birds flying overhead. Some mornings as we watched the sun rise, we could see continuous streams of birds stretching from one horizon to the other as they made their way south for the winter. Not only was this a spectacular sight, 
but it reminded us very clearly how birds connect each of us as well. We saw similarly long lines of snow geese flying over the Laurentian Mountains and stopping to rest in the St. Lawrence Seaway as we crossed Quebec. We saw them again in the prairies and we've seen them flying many times over British Columbia while visiting family in the spring and the fall. So having completed Saskatchewan, we, we arrived at the border with Alberta, which is where we decided to conclude our westward trek at the end of our third year. So what's next? Well, in 2022, we hope to continue westward, hiking 3,500 kilometers across Alberta and British Columbia, hopefully arriving in Victoria next fall, which will mean that we've completed the east to west corridor of the Trans-Canada Trail. Then, if all goes well, in 2023, we will hike from Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta, north through British Columbia, the Yukon, and into the Arctic to get to Tuk 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 in the Northwest Territories, which will bring our 27,000 kilometer trek to a conclusion. Now, there's really no way to summarize 420 days of hiking across our beautiful country, but hopefully our whirlwind tour has given you an idea of some of the different experiences Canada's Trans-Canada Trail has to offer. We've shown you photos of incredible wilderness and wildlife, and we've shared some of our favorite urban pathways. The reality is, however, that by connecting 15,000 communities across Canada, and by visiting all the provincial capitals, quite a bit of the trail is either in or very close to urban areas. So in other words, much of the Trans-Canada Trail is outside the door of most Canadians. And because of this, it is free, easily accessible, and open to everyone to explore in their own way. So as Canadians, we have these incredible opportunities to connect with nature, literally in our own backyards, in our communities, and of course, on the Trans-Canada Trail. We're told all the time that being outside increases our self-esteem and self-awareness, that it reduces the effects of stress and anxiety, it improves our concentration and fosters creativity and innovation. And over the past two years, a growing number of people have come to experience this firsthand, as well as fall in love with birding. As such, we now have an opportunity to encourage people to continue to capitalize on the amazing opportunities that are available to us here in Canada, right here where we live and in our own backyards, as we move into the post-pandemic world. Now is the chance that we can take, as the nature groups and advocates of people getting into nature, as well as bird conservation, to transform people's interests into action. In addition to which, we also still face a situation where many youth clubs like the Scouts and Girl Guides, trail organizations, nature groups, and birding associations are finding it challenging to entice younger individuals to go outdoors, to have an interest in nature, and to be curious and explore. So why is this and what can we do? Well, there are a lot of reasons that people aren't heading outside. For instance, there's a sense that time in nature is non-productive and therefore a waste. There's a pervading social fear that being outside is dangerous and it should be avoided. But it also has to do with the sense that connecting with nature is only possible or worthwhile if we're fully immersed in pristine wilderness, or that real outdoor adventure requires us to travel to far off and exotic locations. And unfortunately, there's also a perception that outdoor activities are something only to be enjoyed by a select few in special locations and at certain times. We've been taught to think that nature is supposed to look a certain way, that to be in the outdoors, we have to look a certain way or be a certain type of person, but none of this is true. Nature is not in one place, and it's not for one special person. Nature is wherever someone is trying to find it, and it is for everyone. The pursuit of nature and time outdoors is enough to make you a birder, an explorer, and an outdoors person. This is the point we've been trying to emphasize in communities as we've hiked for the past three years. Now we're trying to use our hike to break down some of the barriers to getting outside every day that Sean just mentioned. But of course, under normal conditions, those aren't even the biggest issues that come into play for most of us on a daily basis, including our children and grandchildren. The biggest issue is, of course, screen time. Most kids now spend more time on their devices than in nature. Many would rather play video games than play outside after school, and most adults would rather watch a movie or scroll through Facebook and Instagram rather than going outside for a walk after a long, tiring day. And this is largely because such activities take us offline and away from our screens. So the key isn't to try and convince people to give up what they enjoy doing, but rather to find ways to help people use technology and our mobile, mobile devices to explore the world. So we are trying to help people do just that by reconnecting to nature through birding. And when people hear this, their first question often is, 
why birds? Now, I'm sure most of you could probably answer this question possibly better than I can, but it basically comes down to the fact that birds are a great way to connect with nature because they're free and fun to watch and they are everywhere. No matter who you are or where you live, whether it's in an apartment building or a condo tower in the cities, somewhere in the suburbs, or way out in the country, it is impossible to go outside your door and not hear or see at least one bird. And more than that, birds are a great way to connect with nature because they need our help. According to the State of Canada's Birds Report, some groups of birds are doing very well, like waterfowl and birds of prey. And actually those two groups represent a really nice example of how widespread conservation efforts across North America have made a huge difference in helping birds rebound and thrive. Other groups like grassland birds and aerial insectivores, which are birds that feed on flying insects, are not doing so well and they need our help. So where do we begin? Well, one place to begin is as we're trying to emphasize, especially to youth and others who are new to the outdoors, is by becoming a citizen scientist. So what is that? Well, basically it's anyone who makes observations about birds or nature and then reports them online to help scientists understand how our wildlife populations are doing and how we can conserve them. This is great because it means anyone can do it, whether you're five years old or 95, whether you're an amateur or an expert birder, as long as you love going outside, finding really cool things and learning to identify what they are, you can be a citizen scientist. And the great thing is it can be a lot of fun to do with the help of free apps for your phone. So there are several apps that you can use to not only learn about birds, but also to submit your observations to become a citizen scientist. So for any birders in the group, I imagine you are already avid eBird users and we applaud you for this. However, the app that we most often recommend to beginner birders is called iNaturalist, which is freely available for anyone with a mobile device to use and to download. This app is nice because it is really simple to use. Basically, you just take a, a photo of something in the natural world and upload it to iNaturalist. You'll then be presented with a series of photos that you can compare your own with to help you identify what you just took a picture of. Once you submit your photo, you'll get confirmation or a correction for your idea, and your observation will become valuable data that scientists can use to monitor and help our wildlife populations. The other really nice thing about iNaturalist is that you can submit observations of almost anything in the natural world. So not just birds, but also butterflies, insects, bats, reptiles, mammals, flowers, whatever you're interested in, the app will work with it. In addition, it also lets you keep track of your observations. So you can build a life list of all the species you've seen and where you saw them. If you use the Seek version of the app, which is really great for kids, you'll be invited to enter different challenges. And as you build up your collection of species, you'll earn badges for different achievements. So for anyone with kids or grandkids who play video games, this might start to sound pretty familiar. You travel around collecting things, you compete, complete various challenges, you can compete with your friends if you want to, and you earn achievements. So citizen science can be a lot like video gaming, which is something that many people already love to do. But of course, there are several very important differences. It gets you outside and being active. It teaches you about birds and other wildlife. It helps you connect with the natural world. And it makes a huge contribution to conservation. So birds and citizen science are a great way to bridge the divide between our digital world and the natural one. And they are the perfect tool to make exploration and outdoor adventure part of our everyday routine. As we speak to new people across the country who are not necessarily already part of the naturalist or scientific communities, we're only introducing them to citizen science, but we also share a few simple steps to help birds, which many of you are probably already familiar with, and it sounds like you're having a talk in a few days about one of them. First off, we suggest that anyone can have a positive and huge impact on birds and bird conservation by first off buying friendly bird friendly products. Secondly, keeping their cats indoors and their dogs on a leash, especially when they're on beaches. Third, by making their yards more bird friendly. Next, by helping prevent window collisions with birds by putting up decals on their windows. 
then by turning off unnecessary lights, especially during migration season. And finally, by getting local youth who have an interest in nature to become engaged in conservation in their own communities. Each of these has a profound impact beyond your own communities. And the wonderful thing is when we help birds, our actions have a positive impact beyond our own backyards, our own communities, and even our own country. As many of you, well, as you most of you know, many bird species are migratory, which means that every spring they fly north to breed in parts of Canada, and every fall they return to the southern US and parts of Central and South America to overwinter. So this means that many of the bird species we see in our own backyards and work hard to protect locally rely on other habitats as well as the ones that we observe them in. So in Canada, the, the boreal forest is one key example of an essential habitat that is particularly important for many birds. It's known as Canada's bird nursery because over 300 species breed there, and it accounts for the well being of between three and five billion birds. So, any actions that we take in our own backyards and communities have a profound impact on conservation efforts across the continent and help bird species from coast to coast to coast. In essence, it means that our backyards are connected to the boreal. And so if you're putting up a bird feeder or a bird bath in your yard, you're having an impact that extends well beyond your own backyard. These are the messages we've been sharing with new audiences as we walk across Canada. And we've been able to do that through our blog, our talks, interviews, and media coverage. We estimate that we've spoken directly with over 7,500 people in presentations and on the Trans-Canada Trail itself, as well as being able to give Zoom and webinar talks across the nation to an additional 1,400 households about the goals of our hike and ways anyone can help protect birds. We've also learned a few things along the way about inspiring youth to engage with nature. First, there are a lot of people out there who don't necessarily identify as scientists, naturalists, or birders, but they're nonetheless very much aware of the environmental changes going on in their own communities. They're noticing the disappearance of birds at their feeders, and they're very concerned about it. They just don't know what to do to help. Second, we found that many people don't become involved in science, exploration, or nature because they don't feel like they fit into these communities. In some cases, this is because they never considered exploration or birding as options. And others, it's because representations of outdoors people tend to be monolithically Caucasian, and they never considered that joining these communities was even a possibility for them. In some ways, these discoveries represent very good news, because it means that we can send out a message of empowerment, letting people know that, that no matter who they are, they can make a difference or get involved, or simply that they're welcome. And there are people, lots of people, in fact, who are ready to listen and join in, especially with bird conservation and regional environmental protection. Overall, we found is that people are thirsty for engagement and discovery. They want to help. We just left to have to let them know how they can do that and that they're welcome to do it. And so this brings us to what we've learned about outreach. So unsurprisingly, in this day and age, dynamic outreach online and through social media is necessary in order to engage with new and younger audiences. Unfortunately, this is often something that naturalist clubs and trail organizations, which tend to have older memberships, really struggle to provide. A few of the groups we've, we've spoken with have almost no out online presence at all. Others do utilize digital outreach, but they tend to use their social media platforms to broadcast rather than to generate sustained two-way conversations with existing and potential members. The groups which have been most successful in expanding their membership and engaging younger members have been those that provided regular and interactive content through social media. So from what we've seen, the key to fostering these conversations is getting people to see beyond and not simply exist in their own defined social media echo chambers without looking at the larger picture. And as we've learned, this is quite difficult to do. So one of the points of our trek has been to visit communities, talk in schools and present to groups not traditionally approached by conservation groups. And we can honestly say that in every case, our message has been warmly received. We've also found that when trying to spark the curiosity of new audiences, it's necessary to adopt a broader approach to outreach. This might sound obvious, but it can be surprisingly difficult to do as we've discovered. If, for example, we advertise a birding talk, People who aren't already birders or naturalists assume that it will be dry and boring. They won't understand it because they're not experts and they won't be welcome because they aren't birders. Or they might not even hear about the event at all. 
On the other hand, to talk about wildlife along the world's longest recreational trail or exploring Canada tends to pique pe people's interests and appeal to a much wider audience. They're very quickly drawn in and curious about citizen science as a result. To broaden our own message, we've done everything from give interviews to the CBC, to providing presentations at Parks Canada sites and to the Canadian Explorers Club, to talks at public libraries, to visiting schools and leading bird walks along the nation's trails, as well as giving podcasts about exploration and introducing citizen science at outdoor shows, hunting clubs, and even tourism venues. What we found is that people respond better to storytelling and enthusiasm rather than necessarily scientific facts no matter how cool those facts may be to us scientists. Finally, we've learned that providing a message of inclusion and empowerment was one of the most effective outreach strategies for us. Sharing six simple steps to help birds and showing people which free app they can use to become citizen scientists are all really effective ways to transform interest into action. So with all of that said, we will end our talk here. And we'll just close by saying that right now with COVID, we have had an unprecedented opportunity to reach out to new audiences across the country. And we hope that our hike and our message will help inspire people to reconnect with nature and to take advantage of this opportunity. If you'd like to follow our hike through our blog, Facebook, or Instagram, the links are on the screen right now. And we hope that you take the opportunity to follow along as we continue our hike for birds over the coming few years and hopefully we will be getting to Alberta and BC this year. Or if you're interested in seeing how you can support our track and our message, there is also a sponsorship link on our web page. If you have any questions for us, you can contact us online or by email and we'll do our best to answer any questions you might have. And I think maybe there's a couple minutes right now and we can try and answer any questions you might have now as well. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Sonia and Sean. That was an awesome presentation. And it was so cool to see all the different places you've been. It's, it was really something. And I couldn't imagine walking my whole distance too. But it was great. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. I know there were a few questions in the chat box there. So how come mine's not coming up? We want to take a look at that and maybe go through some of that. Um, lots of people saying, you know, how great your presentation was and how much they enjoyed it. And uh, somebody here saying they've signed up for your newsletter. So excellent. My chat box seems to have frozen. Can you go through it on yours? Um, I, I, this is Brian. I can say this. Okay. Uh, um, early on, there was a question about the the first IBA that you mentioned in Alberta when you started listing the IBAs, um, I think it was a, a lake. That, lake Manitou, as somebody mentioned. Yeah. Well, no, I think it's but, Manitou, something like that. There is a list, though, of IBAs mm -hmm. on the Nature Alberta site. There's an entire book that covers all the IBAs in um, Alberta. That's one. Uh, yeah, it was Manitou Lake was the first one. That it was Lake. Manitou? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what was that in? Is that in Saskatchewan or was it? It's in Alberta. It's in Alberta. Oh, I couldn't find it in their book. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, oh, and then where did you where did you usually stay within larger cities? Or did you? No, we had to in many places. It took us a month to cross the uh, greater Toronto region. And unfortunately, that often led us to have to stay in hotels. There was just no... Yeah. It, it absolutely stunned us. Almost from uh, Quebec City through to Barrie, Ontario, which is several months, was really tough. Yeah, yeah. Because that's there's not a lot of uh, uh, handy campgrounds out in the... <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, there aren't a lot to start with. And unfortunately, in the last two years, a lot of the campgrounds have been closed to tent yeah. camping anyways. Yeah. So even the ones that we've kind of been hoping for were just not an option for us this past two years. Okay, okay. well, okay. Yes, but we hope you enjoyed that. Someone said, we hope you enjoy the next two years. <laughs> we're, we're really looking forward to it. Yes, definitely. 
we we have some challenges ahead in British Columbia. Apparently, most of the Trans Canada Trail just does not exist at the moment. It's mm -hmm. been wiped out by the floods, so we'll see um, what happens there. But so Len was uh, was asking how easy was it to follow the trail and thinking is the trail well marked and signed and do you have a map of it and that sort of thing. <laughs> There is a digital map online um, and it varies from region to region to region uh, and area to area. The Trans Canada Trail itself doesn't do a lot of signage. They rely on local trails to sign it. So in some areas, um, it's incredibly well done. There's signs every 50 or 100 feet and you can see the next sign as you're walking. In some areas and in some provinces, there are two or three signs. And so you wind up referring to the map a great deal and really hoping you're headed in the right direction. So. Maybe you can come back and give us another presentation on this last phase of your trip. That would be awesome too. Yeah, we'd love to. <laughs> Alberta is going to be an interesting province. We'll be there twice because once when we head south, and it's the only province that has such a large cross of the Trans Canada Trail in it, and also has the northern branch as well in it. So, um, where would you start from then in, in your next year? We start on the Saskatchewan Alberta border, about 40 kilometers north of Lloyd Minister. Yeah, oh. it's around Onion Lake, sort of tul Tulipy or something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. And then when we go north, we start in Fort Saskatchewan and go north from there. So I just asked you, did you find the most friendly people were in Newfoundland? <laughs> so far. <laughs> because my son and his girlfriend tried to hike there and people just kept trying to pick them up all the time. And they were like, no, we want to hike. And then they gave them food and then they gave them shelter and they <laughs> took them to the airport and they, yeah. They were amazing. When we were walking there, it was actually a source of frustration for me. And yeah. one of the few other people that have ever done it, she's Mel Vogel is currently in the Arctic. And she said, never complain about this because there will come a day you will miss it. And we've stepped into other provinces and been wildly ignored. And you just want a bottle <laughs> of water or you want anyone's help or you want anyone to care. And it just doesn't happen. <laughs> Hmm. Special place. I'm going to go there one day. It's very nice. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions, comments? I think we're just all filled with admiration for what you have done and wish we could do a tiny percentage of what you've accomplished. <laughs> it's a wonderful privilege and a wonderful opportunity. Our parents were a bit terrified when we sold our house to do it, but uh, <laughs> it's not always, not always as uplifting when you're on the trail. There are definitely some challenges, but when you look back and you realize that three or four people have done it, and it's, I mean, people don't have the time, they don't have the money to do it. It's a real privilege and it's wonderful. We're very lucky to be here in Canada. And you're gonna write a book about it? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've done 700 blogs and I think we have about 1200 pages of journals. So we have a lot of material. Well done. Thanks very much. Excellent. Okay, I think that's everything then. So thanks again, Tony and Sean. Uh, that was so enjoyable and really enlightening and fascinating to listen to your tales and travels across the Canada. Um, and like I said, I'll be looking forward to the next phase. So we'll hopefully get you back for that part too. And uh, next meeting coming up, everybody, is on the 18th. And that's about uh, making your backyard appealing to birds. And the presentation there will talk about things that you can do to create a bird-friendly backyard. So hopefully we'll see you all then and look for the communication on that for getting your link to that meeting. Great. So thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, we'll see you hopefully at the next session. Take care. So Karen, you'll, I guess you'll have to stop the recording. Yeah. It takes a little while to finish. Oh, does it?